Welcome to the Resilient Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Doug Kachijan, and today I'm joined by Jason Bresler. Jason is the founder and president of Leadership Under Fire. He has specialized in leadership development, character development, and optimal human performance for over 10 years and frequently addresses leaders and organizations across North America. He calls upon his extensive operational experience in Iraq, Afghanistan, and New York City as he prepares leaders from public safety organizations, business corporations, athletic teams, and academic institutions to perform at their best. Jason serves as FDNY Special Operations Firefighter in Rescue Company 2 in Brooklyn, New York. Prior to becoming a firefighter and creating the Leadership Under Fire team, Jason began his career as an officer in the United States Marine Corps. He has led Marines on several deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan, where he is decorated for his combat service and continues to serve as a major in the Marine Corps Reserves. Jason received a Master's of Science from Oklahoma State University and a second Bachelor's of Science from the University of Maryland. He completed his undergraduate degree at the United States Naval Academy, where he also played Division I baseball for the midshipmen. As you'll see, Jason is somebody who's thought quite extensively about what legitimately constitutes preparation for high-stress environments at the strategic, technical, tactical, and psychological levels. Talks about how, after some of his experiences overseas with the military, he realized that the the human factor was perhaps the greatest thing that needed to be addressed um, from an organizational standpoint when he moved over to the FDNY. And he makes a great distinction between dealing with with failure and success. Um, We talk quite a bit about the construct of mental toughness, which without a proper definition can be problematic. Um, Jason provides a really thorough and very clearly defined um, formula for mental toughness, and he even talks about how he thinks that the ter- that term itself is problematic, but as far as how people generally understand mental toughness, he thinks that it needs to to account for people's ability to, to deal with failure, and he said that's really one of the things that distinguishes high performers when your, your training and the things that you've learned to, or the things, the things you've learned are supposed to work, fail you in high-stress environments, how do you deal with that failure and find other solutions and other strategies? And this is something that's obviously really important for uh, groups like firefighters and, and military personnel. So I think you'll really enjoy Jason's perspective on things. Hey, Jason, thanks so much for coming on. Um, you've had a variety of different career paths, and they all, they all complement each other in, in a certain way. But I wanted to begin by talking a little bit about your background in the, the Marine Corps Um, People tend to assume that like every job in the military is the same or that the military does one thing. And that's obviously not the case. So I wanted you to begin by talking a little bit about what your specific responsibility uh, in the Marine Corps was, especially when you were on deployment. Sure. Uh, First of all, thanks a lot for for having me, Doug. It's a tremendous uh, pleasure and and, and privilege to to be on with you. Um, As it relates to my experiences in the military, more specifically to my, my deployments, I was a I served as a civil affairs team leader with the United States Marine Corps and um, participated in several com- combat deployments in support of uh, Operation Enduring Freedom and uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, deploying to both Iraq and Afghanistan. And as a civil affairs uh, team leader, generally you're attached um, or assigned to uh, an infantry battalion or an infantry regiment. You have a small team of Marines, typically assigned a dedicated uh, in- interpreter and uh, translator who's who's incredibly proficient with the um, with with the native language. Um, and, and your mission pr- primarily is is to forge a relationship with with local leaders and the local populace uh, in order to promote a, st- a stable environment where the local populace and the local leaders. Um, aren't reliant or, or, or aren't dependent on, on the adversary. So in the case of Iraq, the adversary would have been Al- Al-Qaeda. In the case of Afghanistan, the adversary would have been um, the Taliban and, and to some extent. So, you, you know, a small team of Marines, 
you're, you're uh, attached to generally an infantry battalion, which in excess of a thousand infantry uh, marines, um, and your 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 role is to kind of complement their their kinetic efforts. And with by kinetic, I mean the, the weapon systems that, that they have and uh, and em, employ um, like that element of force. And but your your primary tools come in in, in the non kinetic form. Everything ranging from relationships, um, using money and, and, and financial assets to to build relationships, leverage relationships, uh, j- jumpstart uh, labor, um, b- build projects ranging from uh, access to healthcare to education uh, to improved infrastructure. Basically, those those types of things that are that are critical in any uh, in, in any economy or, or, or environment around the, the globe that's that's primarily the job of a civil affairs team yeah what, what's fascinating about that what most people probably won't understand if they don't have experience in the military is that people might consider something like civil affairs a, a soft skill or a, a soft job because it's you know your, your primary job isn't to be a shooter but in a lot of ways it's actually more dangerous than somebody who's overtly seeking confrontation because effectively I think what, what your job boiled down to was who can I trust in this local population to you know help build some semblance of stability in the community and you don't speak the language you haven't been immersed in the culture so you're heavily reliant on your interpreter who presumably is trustworthy but even beyond that you're you're trying to read somebody's body language and even their spoken communication through an intermediary. So I guess my what, what, I'm, what I really want to know from you is, first of all, how do you really uh, train, if it's even possible, to develop that, that ability to determine who's actually trustworthy? And then how do you, you know, along a similar vein, how do you walk that line between um, vig- vigilance and agreeableness? Because if you're walking around these communities, obviously, you know, with your full body armor and your, your gun at the ready, it's going to be very hard to have tea with a, a village elder and get that village el- elder to provide, um, you know, intelligence about maybe some of the, the enemy in the area. So if you can kind of elaborate on, on those things a little bit. Sure. I'd be, I'd be glad to, uh, first to your point regarding the, the risk, um, and the perceived risk to an element such as this, as, as compared to a, an infantry unit. Um, yeah, to a large extent, it, it, it's counterintuitive. Oftentimes, these, these softer units actually are subject to more more risk because you're actively patrolling a very lethal and dangerous in, environment, and ideally, you're you're not you're not looking for a confrontation. I mean, obviously, if a threat pre- presents itself and and folks' lives are are at risk, you're going to respond to that threat aggressively and with with force. But but the name of the game. Is to is to kind of change that dynamics, and to patrol in the areas where there are, are local forces or, or elements that are either enabling the violence, or more concerningly, actively taking um, part in, in that day to day violence. And you're working to create another option f- for them, or to get them to maybe reevaluate um, th- their options. In, in such a way that they're less likely to continue to uh, to promote or, or participate in, in the violence. In order to do so, you know, you, you have to uh, actively patrol into these areas and you have to engage um, the, the personnel and the, the key leaders that are that are actively in, in, involved. Um, you know, your question that you raise is how, how do you train for this? And, and uh, it, it's, it's certainly not easy. You know, there's a tactical component to all of this. You go out to the rifle range, you have some targetry, you bring your weapons, you shoot during the day, you shoot at night, you shoot static. Um, once easy, you're proficient easy, with those, easy, easy then, part, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then you, then you shoot at night, and then you shoot uh, maneuvered, and then you know all of those things. But how do you how do you walk into an environment where where just even the thought process of the, of the locals is 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 almost diametrically opposed to ours here in the in the Western world? Um, where, where they look at life, uh, uh, religion, outcomes, um, government, you know, you name it, fundamentally different 
differently than we do here in the uh, in, in the Western world. Um, and it's one of those things where, yeah, to some extent, you can create training scenarios or, or you can read, but but so much of it is experiential, and that that experience then um, pr- promotes and fosters uh, in, intuition. Which certainly isn't always going to be right, but but it, hopefully it's going to get you closer to where you need to be. The, the biggest question is when you find yourself in these environments is I think the looming question is who are we fighting, and not just how are they fighting. That, that tends to be generally pretty obvious in terms of their their means and methods. But why why are they fighting? And once we can identify the reasons why those sources of instability that then um, foster their, their, their motivation, what, what can we do to address it? And uh, that's, that's the name of the game right there. When I, I found myself in Fallujah about a decade ago with a small team of Marines at the height of the insurgency. And I had virtually no training in, in, in any, any of this. All of my training in the military to that point in time had, had been 100% uh, con- conventional. And uh, I had the good fortune of uh, finding myself uh, being mentored by a gentleman who was a chief officer five in the, in the Marine Corps, which is incredibly rare in its uh, – in, in itself, and, and this gentleman had three decades in the Marine Corps as a reserve, it's almost a side job, and it, his uh, primary means of employment um, over the course of 30 years had been as a Chicago police officer, namely counter or, or uh, anti, anti-gang, and uh, he kind of took me under his, his, his wing and, and taught me how to think and how to how to function and operate in an environment as, as complex as, uh, as, as this, because it's, uh, it's incredibly, incredibly, uh, gray. And, and so oftentimes the, the, the solutions, um, are, are entirely non, non-linear and, and very much almost counter to Western, uh, lo- logic and, and rationale. Um, but a few of the things that, that we learned that I learned very early on from from this gentleman. His name was uh, Jim Russell, and he's he's since since retired. Uh, and the funny thing is, affectionately we, we referred to him as the as the Grand Ayatollah because <laughs> this gentleman was incredibly uh, was incredibly wise, both in a scholarly sense, but then also as a as a practitioner. Um, but you know, really resist and dis- resist the urge to solve local problems with a with a Western Western solution, um, which is much easier said than done. Uh, be, be open-minded to, to, to nonlinear solutions. And, and oftentimes the, the best solution is, is going to be the solution that, that the locals, uh, rec- recommend, um, equally significant, uh, is the notion that, once you're in their homes, you're in their hearts, and once you're in their hearts, their their, their world is their, their word is gospel, and, and that that might sound a little bit uh, cliche or or uh, um, probably not exactly consistent with the vernacular that you expect from a U.S. Marine, but probably rather from somebody in the Peace Corps or or, or a missionary. But but so much of this is 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 based on relationships hmm. and. Um, you know, I only did a, a, I only did a few tours, but but I I can confidently look look back now in retrospect, and there were a number of units that were quite content with with approaching the battle space. Um, it, they're patrolling like they were tourists. You know, they go out for an hour in the morning, they come back to the fob, they go out for an hour after, uh, hour in the afternoon, put a check in the box. But but that type of patrolling doesn't lend itself relation to relationships and. And without relationships, you're never going to really understand um, the, the the problem set. You're certainly not going to understand what would compel people to, to fight. And without that understanding, you're never going to create holistic solutions that 
that might incentivize them to, to stop fighting and, and to partner with your uh, to partner with you. No, and that, and that really speaks to how sometimes there can be a disconnect between what's going on at the strategic level and then what's going on at the tactical level, where it sounds like the bulk of your training, you know, prior to deployment, focused on you know sh- uh, shooting and moving and communicating, and not so much on some of those soft skills. And it's just fascinating that either you're part of the most technologically sophisticated military in the history of the world, but you're, you're effectively saying that your survival was contingent upon the relationships that you forged, the, the instincts you developed, and even that, that apprenticeship style of learning that you re- received under the tut- tutelage of the, the mentor who was a, uh, a law enforcement officer. And it just seems like we're always trying to find w- ways around the human factor, like you know machine learning or algorithms and there's obviously a place for that in certain contexts, but I don't think we're ever going to be able to get rid of those things and still um, achieve the, the results that we want, especially when it comes to, to warfare, which is still effectively, you know, it's a human conflict until we get replaced by a robot. So, um, you know, the military evolves through actor, after action reviews and, and debriefs, and fortunately you have the, the luxury of, of hindsight here. So knowing what you know now, what things do you think would have better prepared you for some of the situations that you encountered while you were deployed? Sure. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a great question. So I, I would say much more attention to the uh, the, the soft skills. Um, you know, when you think about a, a ground combat unit going to, going to war, you can easily, easily conjures up a, a list of, of skills that they would want to be proficient at. Um the, the hard skills, the, the, sh- the shooting, moving, and, and, and communicating, the, the tactical communication. But then equally significant, probably even more significant, are going to be those those soft skills. And mo- more training probably that addresses the mental aspect of human performance. Um, just kind of how we, we each in individually function in a in a high stress environment, particularly in a high stress environment where there's fatigue and sleep deprivation and, and malnourishment, um, extreme climates where we're going to be there for a period of an extended period of time where there's probably going to be frequent, uh, loss, loss of human, of human life. Um, ranging to uh, aspects of emotional intelligence that, that historically, probably outside of the special operations community um, haven't been incorporated into, into con- training for conventional uh, military outfits uh, and, and units. But back to the question of how do you, how do you read someone who, who comes from an entirely different culture? There's, there's gotta be an element of emotional intelligence in it. I, I need to have some sense of, of empathy, right? I don't necessarily need to be sympathetic to, to their to their plight or to their ideology, but I, I at least need to be empathetic to the extent that I can, um, even as grotesque as I might find their their uh, their violent acts, but, but at least to the extent where I can I can make sense and understand why they would why they would fight. Or, or, or what possibly could, could have uh, influenced or, or driven them driven them to fight um, those sorts of scenarios or th- those types of uh, elements of training I, I think would be very valuable uh, I think I spoke previously or touched on the cultural immersion piece you know where if you're content living on the, the forward operating forward operating base and partaking in tours and patrolling you're never really going to gain a, a solid understanding of your area of operations, the key players, the, the people in their, their history, as well as the, the adversary. Um, you know, I, I had the good fortune of studying under the tutelage of uh, Jim Russell, the, the Grand Ayatollah in, in Iraq. And then when 2009, when I was preparing my Marines for a, another deployment to southern Afghanistan, um, I, I certainly recognized that Afghanistan was probably going to be as, as different from Iraq as it, as it was sim- similar. But the manner in which we approach counterinsurgency and stability operations would probably largely be the same in terms of the methodology. And that methodology starts with who are we fighting? 
uh, why are they fighting? And a lot of the Marines that I had 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 zero uh, real world ex- experience. They they had possibly been out on, on a few deployments here and there, but none of them had done um, I- embedded or or immersed uh, civil affairs work. So what we did is at the time we we were we were in D.C. not too far from from Baltimore, and I had some buddies that were cops, firemen, and, and paramedics in, in Baltimore City. And at the time, um, I think The Wire, the HBO series, Great show. had just yeah. been released. It's it's phenomenal. Da- David Simons did a phenomenal job with with that and, and kind of capturing all of the the layers of, com- of complexity. Yeah. They're, they're in the city ranging from the, the, the drug dealers to uh, the innocent folks that are kind of caught in this, this situation um, to uh, the, the role of the press uh, t- to the police. And I thought that I thought the closest thing to, to, to Afghanistan might be the, the mean streets of Baltimore. So what we did is uh, we did some training with um, some counter narcotics and anti-gang cops in, in Baltimore. A uh, few of which had, had been service members and had served overseas, and then I also had my Marines um, do ride-alongs with the with the paramedic units. Wow! Because I wanted them to not only experience kind of the complexity of of uh, of life on the on the mean streets of Baltimore, uh, but also to see violent uh, firsthand and, and, and trauma. You know, I, the first time I wanted <clears throat> I. I didn't want the first time a young Marine was going to see blood and guts uh, for that to be of, of one of his, um, his his Marines, you know, to his, to his left or right. And uh, we just come back after the weekend. You know, guys had been out. They'd, they'd seen some stuff firsthand, come back and, and dissect it and, and, and talk through it. You know, and almost like, hey, if we were going to patrol into Baltimore tomorrow, how would we attack? How would we address that problem? These, these problem sets. What would we do to stabilize, um, to promote st- stability? What would we do to undermine some of the more violent, violent gangs? And very quickly, you start to see, with even just a little bit of exposure, you start to see nuances p- play out, and, and you start to really, you know, the, the, the overly simple um, solution to a complex problem. Uh, you know, very very quickly, some some of the even less experienced guys start to question its its feasibility, and they quickly gain appreciation for the, the shades of gray and complexity in these environments. That that's really cool, and um, you know, a lot of the, the guests that I have in the podcast are people that I know personally, yourself included. I had no idea that you um, you prepared for Afghanistan by going to Baltimore, um, which is, I mean, makes makes a lot of sense. And, I, and you brought the wire too, which is funny because I actually want to do an entire episode just on how the wire is a great example of complexity and an emergent order and kind of the gray world that we live in. Um, and I, I totally agree with you on everything you said, as far as, you know, if, if you had to do it all over again, what you do, would have done more of. Uh, and, and I think people oftentimes take things out of context and they'll be like, Oh, well, is he saying that we shouldn't shoot? I mean, I'm going to speak for you and say, you're not saying guys shouldn't shoot and go to the range before they deploy. You're just saying they should do these, other things to to complement those skills, but and, and I know knowing how the military works, the the inevitable kind of rebuttal to to your answer is going to be, well, you know, I am a I'm your your commander or I'm a higher ranking officer, you know, several several r- rungs up the ladder, and it's obviously very easy to quantify, you know, how a marine shoots at the range. You could say, well, you know, we have a, a shooting standard; they have to get this many shots within a box and center mass and if they don't get enough shots in and they're not qualified and they have to keep doing it again. And when they pass the test, we know that they're quote unquote, you know, ready to deploy. Obviously the things that you're talking about are much more difficult to quantify. So did you encounter any resistance to some of the initiatives that you took and whether you did or you didn't, um, if you had to justify, you know, how these things can be quantified, is there, is there a way to do it or does that require more of a leap of faith to say, look, like, it's more important that we expose these Marines to these different types of environments and to these, these nuanced um, types of situations versus saying, well, there's like a, a black or a white standard. 
Yeah, from a training management perspective, um, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the Marine Corps pales in, pales in size compared to the Army, but it's there's still 178,000 Marines on active duty. I mean, it's from a training management perspective, it's, it's incredibly difficult to not only tr- train or to develop the, the quality and caliber of, of training programs that, that lend themselves to some of the dynamics of, or aspects that we're, we're speaking of, but also then how to, how to measure it, how to document it, particularly because a lot of times the, the metrics shift from being um, quality, or quantitative you know, uh, Lance Corporal Schmuckatelli fired mm-hmm. 10 rounds, eight times he hit the target, twice he missed, right? To be, it becomes, t- takes on much more qualitative type of uh, sure. um, metric or, or, or measurement. And sometimes it's just like you, you kind of know it when you see it. And, uh, and, and much of it is ex- experiential, but then it's also a huge part of it is, is experiential is experimental. I mean, a lot of times when we walk into, when we deploy to Iraq or Afghanistan, be, because of the strategic nature, we tend to look at those environments as being mo- monolithic, right? Like, you I mean, even Ambar province, like that was, that was the Sunni, the Sunni stronghold. I mean, if you traveled from Fallujah to Ramadi and, and then now Qaim, three different battle spaces that were all relatively in the same geographic region, with largely the same people from the same tribes, but but the nature of the insurgency there and the the, the nuances and the idiosyncrasies of the, of that insurgency were were, were, were very very different. Um, so so uh, I do think that there, there was a period of time and they probably were still using it as a resource where the military would tap into retired law enforcement officers because I, I really think that there are a lot of similarities. Um, but between policing, I mean, even to the extent community-based policing, there, there's certainly some parallels between that and, and some of the uh, – and I think cops inherently, uh, particularly in the inner city, urban environments, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, D.C., Camden, New Jersey, Philadelphia, they, they become uh, comfortable and, and confident and, perti- and proficient functioning in that, in, in that gray um, where where the use of force is much more restrictive than than it is in a conventional fight in the military. But to reinforce it, a, another point that you raised is, um, you know, th- the perception that that maybe <clears throat> my thought process or or our thought process is is uh, is, is 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 less aggressive. Um, that that that's certainly not the case. I uh, the, the only thing better than going on patrol. And kicking the snot out of it, out of an adversary who was irreconcilable in his will, meaning that, that no matter what you did to make life better for him and his, his family, he was still fervently committed to to a radical and extreme extreme cause um, that was never going to be reconciled. The only thing better than than actively going on patrol and uh, kicking the snot out of him would be forging a relationship. With a local tribe or, or mem- members of the local populace who, at the beginning of your deployment, were were part of the adversary element and, and were actively or looking to, to harm you, forging a relationship with them, participating in a patrol where you're supporting them, and now they're kicking the, the, the snot out of the guy who's irreconcilable. I mean, that's that's winning. One of the problems we have is, at least at the conventional level, like our award system and, and the incentives and the, and the rewards and recognition for, for a job well done for ground combat units tends to favor the individual that does it himself rather than the individual that equips and, and trains the, the, the local sure. um, or the indigenous population to, to do that. You know, and of course, there's, there's an element of ego involved in, in, in that too. But, but when you build a relationship and you say, you know what, six months ago, this guy – uh, was was trying to hurt me, and now I, I consider him a, a comrade in arms, and he's he's doing things to uh, to, to neutralize or, or destroy the irreconcilable element. That's uh, I mean that, that's that's mission success, right? And what enables that is are all of those soft skills that we're we're touching on and referring to. 
Yeah, and that's just the kind of stuff that, you know, our, our news cycle tends to be very superficial as far as the, the information that it provides, especially when it comes to, um, you know, armed conflict. And these are the kind of stories, I mean, it's just amazing. You have people between 18 and, and 25 years old in a lot of cases who are doing this ground level type diplomacy and forging relationships with people of different cultures. And I mean, obviously it's very difficult to do that on a large scale, but at least on a micro level, there are units that are doing this. And um, like in a lot of cases, learning on the fly um, and it's just really, really remarkable work. And, it, and it's a story that often isn't told. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. Now, I want to transition into um, your work in the, in the fire department. So if I understand correctly, I think you've got a, you come from a family of, of firefighters. So you went from the, the Marine Corps to the FDNY. What did you at least initially see as far as the, the primary similarities or, or differences between uh, the Marine Corps model of performance and leadership relative to the FDNY? Yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm certainly biased, obviously, having spent um, my entire adult life serving in, in either one or, or both of the organizations. Um, but but the Marine Corps and the FDNY are held in, in incredibly high high regard um, nationally in, in large part because I think both organizations have are, are rich in tradition and ha- have an incredible lineage and in, in history of um, taking ag- aggressive action uh, in, in the face of d- danger for, for the greater good of, uh, of humanity. So I was a, uh, I'm a third generation firefighter. My, my grand, my grandfather's a firefighter. My father was a, was a fireman, um, kind of break, broke a little way away from the family mold. And then I, I was, uh, I had the opportunity to go to, to, to college right out of high school, something that, that no one in my family had ever had the opportunity to do. Um, went to Naval Academy, graduated, was fortunate enough to, to go in the Marine Corps, something that I, I really wanted to do. Um, did a number of years on active duty, and then at first opportunity, I, uh, I, I came to New York to, to, to join the fire department. And the, the organizations are uh, – they're, they're probably more di- different than they are, than they are s- similar. Um, I, I think that – as far as as far as similarities, I mean, I, I think both organizations pride themselves on being very um, re- responsive. I mean, in the city of New York, yes, somebody, what do, what do they think about when they call nine one one? That they're generally going to say that they know the FDNY is 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 coming and is going to uh, arrive with a with a firm commitment to making the situation better. And and obviously, the Marine Corps prides itself on being our nation's nine one one force and in readiness and, and the fire service to a large extent, particularly in the Eastern half of the United States and in the Northeast is, is paramilitary dating back to its earliest roots, which were um, kind of po- post civil war. Many of the men that, that served our nation in several campaigns along the Eastern seaboard um, during the C- civil war had a huge role in creating the first formalized fire departments from Philadelphia to Boston to, to New York, and in that regard, the, the American Fire Service, to include the FDNY, is is, is paramilitary. Um, but but in terms of differences, because I, I, I think the differences are probably even more significant than the similarities. Um, and you, you touched on this earlier, but every everyone in the organization, in in most fire departments, and and it's certainly the case in the New York City Fire Department, but started as a candidate and, and came up through the ranks, so, some quicker than others. But everyone at some point was 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 in the trenches, and they never really lose sight um, or or memory of of what it was like to to be a to be a probie uh, in in a New York City firehouse. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that, that at times maybe plagues the military is that it's a it's a move up or move out. It's predicated on a move up or move out model in terms of career advancement and, and, and promotion, and and that it inevitably at times lends itself to to careerism, where leaders sometimes do um, 
you, you know, when forced with a dilemma, they'll, they'll do what's it, what's in their best interest because it's going to directly impact their their promotion or, or their advancement. Um, and the other thing too is in the military, uh, I, I think with every time you get promoted, I mean, the, the best officers certainly don't don't fall trapped to this, but but leaders can easily become insulated and isolated from from tactical units. And um, sometimes it's, you, you know, like forgetting where you come, came from. Some guys were never really even at that at that level, like down in the trenches with the uh, with, with the troops. Whereas the fire service, um, uh, leaders are less likely to become insulated or, or, or isolated. And, uh, you know, we, in the New York City Fire Department, we, we, certain, we certainly honor and, and respect the, the, the officer ranks. But there's a little bit more, uh, a little greater sense of, of humility um, because sometimes the senior guys, you know, guys with a tremendous amount of time, who a guy who's a firefighter who has 25 years on, who's looking at a captain who might have came on the fire department with him, but is a, is a captain, you know, he'll, he'll pay him his respect due for his rank. But he, he's not afraid to, to kind of keep the captain in, in, in check uh, in instances where maybe the captain's you know, displaying signs that he, he might have forgotten where he, he, he came from, if even just for a few a few seconds or, or an instance. You, you certainly wouldn't see that play out um, yeah, right. in, in, in the military. The, the rank structure is entirely in, entirely rigid, and, uh, you know, the, the model's just different. I mean, one of the things, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's somewhat obvious, but, you know, in the U.S. military, probably 80% of your enlisted, uh, probably including your officer court, you know, folks do four years and, and they move on. So, so much of your, uh, of your forces is, is very young, you know, very, very young in, in age. Um, and th- th- that age composition or, or makeup kind of lends itself to a model. that's more rigid where, you know, this is, the, I mean, the, the colonel, has been in the Marine Corps 25 years. There's only one or two other guys in the entire regiment that had been in the organization for more than more than two decades. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, in public service, public safety organizations, fire department, police departments, a lot of times you have you have guys you didn't promote or senior guys, and they still have a lot of uh, a lot of inf- informal influence um, throughout the organization, and that's uh, that, that's a good thing. Yeah, it's interesting you you brought that up because we were talking. A little bit before we start recording about whether the the officer enlisted distinction in the military is antiquated, and I mean we could do a whole discussion just on this, so I don't want to I don't want to dwell on it. But effectively, the the only difference in the barrier to entry, or the primary difference, uh, in, as far as the barrier to entry um, into the military between the officer and the enlisted force, is a college degree. So to a large extent, the military is outsourcing its initial what they're calling leadership training to, you know, a civilian institution, which in, in some ways, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of these universities are dysfunctional in their own right, but someone goes to college and then presumably is qualified to be an officer and still has to go through the, the officer candidate school um, or sometimes, you know, the service academy serve both purposes where they, you, they provide an undergraduate degree and an off, a military officer training as well. But you've got, you've got enlisted people in the military who, in a lot of cases, also have, um, whether it's undergraduate degrees or advanced degrees. And you can even make a case that someone, an enlisted person who's been in the military four years, is way more qualified to, to be an officer or whatever that means or assume more responsibility in the military than somebody who just graduated from college. So, I mean, the, the, obviously, any large organization has to have some type of rank structure or hierarchy. I mean, you've got all these progressive tech companies that have more horizontal or bottom up type leadership models. But at a certain point, you still have to have, you know, you still have to have leadership at the top that can make some of the, um, the more important decisions. So do you think that the military leadership model, as far as distinguishing the officers from the enlisted force is, is necessary, or do you think that it sometimes might actually uh, interfere with, with what maybe we, we perceive true leadership to be? Yeah, um, you know, no, no system is perfect. I mean, for, first, let me say, I mean, as as uh, 
as well as I think the the the, the uh, advancement system in the New York City Fire Department works. I mean, it largely is based on a, a strict civil service model where, after a said number of years, I think it's three, four, uh, maybe even five, but a firefighter can study for a lieutenant. Um, promotion to lieutenant is contingent only on a civil service exam. Hundred questions taken, you know, on an exam taken uh, at a public school in New York City on a on a Saturday, um, every four years. So, experience, uh, the activity level of the company that you 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 worked with, those things become um, significant once you get promoted, but have absolutely no bearing on your uh, your, your your perceived fitness for for promotion. The, the military model tends to be a little bit more, much more comprehensive in that, uh, you know, the starting point, as you refer to, is a, a college degree uh, or um, at, at any school or uh, to, to include a service academy, uh, completion of officer candidate school, and then you you, uh, you become a second lieutenant or, or an ensign if you're in the Navy and, and Coast Guard, and then um, assigned to your specialty school and then you go to your first uh, your first unit pr- promotion thereafter. Then is contingent on um, largely to some extent your, your quality of, of service and contributions, and then your per- the perceived um, your your ability to, to contribute in the uh, in the future, which to some extent is probably um, judged by your, your contributions to. Uh, to date, and, and ultimately, your, your boss, your, your commander, um, d- determines that. Um, but as it relates to as it relates to whether or not that that model is sustainable, I, I think in conventional units, I, I think that it, it works, and it, it's, it's probably um, probably a sound model. Where you see a little bit of a, a little bit of a shift is in unconventional units. Um, special operations units, where sometimes the the distinction between officer and enlisted be, becomes l- much less uh, much less rigid. Um, a little bit more intimacy and familiarity between the officers and and the troops, largely because it's 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 a small team. Um, everyone is is uh, is inheriting inheriting similar levels of similar levels of, of risk and it's and these folks are functioning in settings where you truly want buy-in and consensus you know you if you're if you're the team leader you, you don't want to be told it's a good idea because the corporal thinks you want to be told it's a good idea you, you want to know it's it's you know your idea is a, is a is a good one and more importantly it's 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 um it shouldn't be just your idea i mean at the end of the day you, you're your men, your men are going to execute the mission. If they don't believe in the mission, then I, I certainly want the, wouldn't want them to, uh, to to execute it. There's a time there's a time for consensus and collaboration, and there's a time where where largely everyone is gonna is gonna is gonna function and execute. But um, during the, the planning and, and prep phase, everyone I I'm of the belief that everyone should have should, should have a, a, a voice and should be able to voice any concerns that they have. Um, you know, Joe Petraeus probably said it best when he said rank is not an indicator of, of, of talent. And, and anyone that thinks it is, um, is, is uh, probably has an inflated sense of, sense of, uh, sense of worth or, or value. Because I, I will tell you with, um, without an ounce of reservation that the, the, the best um, ideas that we had in places as complex as Fallujah or southern Afghanistan were, were the product of my young Marines. You know, I talk about adaptation and, and innovation and, you know, it's like, all right, let, let's what's the problem set here? And then, you know, th- these guys will come up with solutions that far surpassed some of the solutions that, that left to my own devices I would have crafted. I mean, some of these guys grew up on the mean streets of different cities across the United States, rural America. I mean, they didn't have the good, the good fortune of being able to school, go to school at the Naval Academy for, for four years. But in the heat of the moment, in the world's uh, most lethal and unforgiving place, these guys had consistently had, had solutions and ideas that were every bit 
and, and frequently even better than, than the ideas that I would have had um, left in my devices. And I had, had far more formal education and military training than, than these young men had had. Well, that's, that's a really thoughtful answer. I mean, it, it just speaks to the need for uh, a flexible, fluid leadership model depending on the, the situation. And I think the, you know, the question for the people who think about these things is whether or not a college degree should be the distinguishing factor um, as to you know who, who gets to assume the most responsibility and ultimately uh, receive the most pay. And that's obviously you know a topic for another time. But I wanted to go back to the fire department where – you know, you came from this pretty, um, obviously, high-stress, high-performance background in the military. You go to the fire department. What what low-hanging fruit did you initially encounter there, either at, like, a micro or a macro level in terms of, like, whether it was individual firefighter performance or even in just terms of the, the command structure or the leadership structure that compelled you to start your own organization called uh, Leadership Under Fire, where you, you actually now um, – you help train other firefighters to implement some of the principles that you developed and, and, and learned while on some of your deployments um, in the military. Uh, sure. So I, it probably took, it, it took me a, a number of years to, to really, to get to a point where um, I, I felt like I had a, a really good understanding of the New York city fire department's, um, Cultural cu- culture, and then its its uh, kind of strengths and some of its limitations or, or operational weaknesses. Um, you're talking about an organization with a tremendous lineage in, 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 in history, and you know it, it's a uh, it's a very large organization and, and di- diverse. You know, from 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 uh, borough to borough in terms of culture and and um, kind of operational philosophy, but the, the most, and I touched on it earlier, but, but w- without question, the most formative experience in my life was uh, that, that deployment in Fallujah where we partnered with the local tribes and got them to st- stop fighting us and then to start actively fighting and ultimately expel Al-Qaeda where I was standing under the tutelage of Jim Russell. But if you had given me an index card when I went to Fallujah in the summer of 2006 and said, hey, write down five things it's going to take for you to, for you to win, uh, to, to move towards mission accomplishment, and also reduce the vulnerability of your, um, of your, of your troops to, to death or injury, the five things that I would have probably written down would have centered on te- tactics, techniques, Technology, um, probably to some extent, sh- strategy. If you had given me an index card on the back end of that deployment during a period of, of reflection, maybe a month or two after returning home, it said, "All right, write down the five things that it that it took to achieve the effects um, in terms of moving towards the desired end state of uh, expelling Al Qaeda and, and, and keeping your Marines safe to return home." What, what five variables or attributes or factors uh, I probably wouldn't have written down, written down tactics, techniques, and, and technology. Um, I, I would have probably written down collective will, mindset, r- relationships, um, a, a better understanding of a better sense of risk management, and... Um, Something about intelligence and in, 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 uh, driven operations. <laughs> so, a tremendous shift in, in those seven months that fostered an uh, incredible appreciation for the human factor, ranging from mental toughness, um, particularly on days where where your unit is taking it on the chin. And you've lost several buddies, or you've had several buddies' lives who are forever changed by by a catastrophic IED blast. So, ranging from mental toughness to critical thinking, um, you know, right up to empathy, tr- trying to trying to gain a greater understanding of why your adversary fights and how you can how you can influence uh, that 
um, up to navigating the, some of the complex moral dilemmas. You know, and on the surface, it, it's like a decision. Do I do this or do I do this? But when you start to peel back the layers, um, it's, it's, a, it's a moral dilemma in the sense that, you know, as a leader, you're obligated to so, so many different forces or uh, policies or procedures or laws or uh, and then ultimately how, how do you how do you navigate a situation where you can't honor all of those um, simultaneously at least not and craft a, a timely uh, a timely responsive solution so I, I just walked away I, I, I returned home from the experience with a newfound appreciation for the human factor in, in so many different, so many different ways. And to, to some extent, the Marine Corps um, touches on it minimally uh, in, in, in training second lieutenants. But the interesting thing was that I played baseball in, in, in college. Um, I played competitively growing up and really the only time in my life where there there was a lot of attention given to the mental aspect of, of performance was in, was in competitive, competitive sport, hmm. you know, to the extent that I thought that, 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 that skill was, um, or that, that aspect of performance wasn't, wasn't neglected. So I returned to the New York city firehouse and, you know, I worked in a pretty active firehouse in, in the middle of the Bronx. I went to flyers and emergencies on a, on a frequent basis. And for all of our strengths as an organization, Tactically, we're, we're, we're very strong. Technically, we're very pr- proficient. Um, our, our training curriculum, our our ulcer development, ulcer advancement um, models, all of those things are, are very strong when it comes to t- the techniques and, and, and tactics. But what I what I quickly um, started to realize on on the heels of this formative Fallujah deployment. Was that the FDNY didn't really uh, emphasize human performance um, to, to the same extent? I mean, we, you know, as an organization, most guys have a very good understanding of how buildings respond to, to stress, um, building construction, how fire behaves in different types of, of, of buildings, different configurations, etc. But but most folks, even our senior leaders, some of our, our most seasoned veterans um, just didn't possess a very good understanding of, of the human factor of how our most critical resource us how, how we function in high high stress or high threat environments and and I just thought that 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 would be a great place to start you know in terms of making um, an organization that's, that's already has a phenomenal reputation uh, and for good reason ma- making it even better for sure and then you talked a little bit about mental toughness and I'd like you to elaborate on that because I come from more of like a sports background and that's kind of what I do now. And, you know, obviously the the military background as well. And a lot of sports organizations, um, they'll, they'll bring in someone from the military to put them through almost like a, a soft, you know, special operations selection simulation where that you've got these athletes who in some cases are making a lot of money, you know, running around with logs over their head or boats on their head or crawling through mud presumably to make them mentally tougher. And I think that they've kind of missed the point a little bit. So when you talk about mental toughness, like how are you defining that? And then how are you, you cultivating it versus maybe what the perception might be um, like in the, in the sports world or people who perhaps misapply some of the way that the military select people, people don't realize is that, you know, the military uses physical punishment to, to select people, not to train people per se, or to expose some of the characteristics they already possess, not to to cultivate those characteristics. So, how do you go about actually, you know, like I said, defining and cultivating mental toughness as a construct? Yeah, sure. So, sometimes I, I I even hesitate to use the word uh, or the term mental toughness because it precisely to your point, it it, it, conjure, it conjures up this this image of um, you know almost like f- full metal jacket or right. Or a Navy SEAL going through through buds during during surf torture, uh, you know. And look, all of those things probably to to some extent um, 
help help to foster men, mental toughness. But that's that's pretty much the antithesis of what I of what I'm referring to. Um, more what I'm referring to is uh, in, it tends to be a little bit, I guess, softer in, in theory in terms of construct. But what what are the skills that you you, you go to um, when you experience failure, even micro failure? Yeah. You know what what are the skills that you use to embrace? Um, for instance, we use a fire a fire uh, scenario. I'm, I'm forcing a I'm forcing a door at, at a fire. I'm on the floor above the, uh, the fire, <clears throat> high high risk area to to, to be in. Um, and it's uh it's chaotic, limited visibility. Um, it's 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 warm. It's 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 hot. You know, I'm wearing my gear. Um, my my heart rate's up. And, and uh, the stakes are high. I, I got to force this door and get in this apartment. One to offer some refuge for me and the guys I'm with, and two is to to search for potentially trapped occupants. And I'm using the techniques that I know to be true tactically, but but they're not they're not working, right? But where do where do I go, right? And where I go, the the, the physical element of where I, aspect of where I go is going to be entirely predicated on where I go mentally. So so what are the skills that that I've um, intentionally cultivated over over time to be able to use in that situation. Where really on the surface it's a basic skill, but now I'm I'm executing it in, in an advanced uh, in scenario that you would probably put, you know, graduate level advanced uh, uh, situation. So. What are those skills that I that I use? Many of those skills, quite quite frankly, are are pretty um, are, are pretty basic. Right? Everything from self talk to negative thought avoidance to having a physical and mental reset to um, connecting my breathing to, to to my performance, doing things to kind of dial back my my level of arousal physiologically. Um, to increase the likelihood that I'm not going to lose my fu- my fine motor skills, or I'm not going to become uh, experience too much tunnel vision. You know, I'm probably delve a little bit more into into science than I, pro- you know, but but what are those at, at its core? What are the skills that I that I use, not just physically, but but mentally, because that connection is very strong there physiologically. What are the skills that I use? Um, to increase the likelihood that I'm going to succeed where my mind starts to water, wander off into the outcome. Well, what if this thing goes? And then I recognize, look, that's not helpful right now. I, I, I got to be immersed in the, in the process right now where I come back to that process and those things right now. And, you know, of course the conversation, they sound, they, they sound pretty, pretty simple and, and, and easy. But the, the fact of the matter is those, those skills and those concepts and even just that way of thinking is incredibly critical in a, in a high risk high threat scenario and you, you could take you could take the firefighting forcing a door on the floor above the fire scenario and, and translate it to ground combat to aviation to you know you, you scuba diving you you name it but when i refer to mental toughness um kind of on a micro level that's that's what i'm referring to and then there's up to the macro level how how does a team how does a team absorb absorb failure you know, how, how do we promote um a sense of a type of reflection and, and learning that's going to allow us to get back into the fight and uh, allow us to honor that commitment to the, to the mission uh, where we're not going to be paralyzed by, by self-preservation, particularly in the, in the wake of a catastrophic um, outcome. So that's, that's really, I mean, look, we all, no one needs to teach us how to, how to conduct ourselves or, or how to feel after we, after we win. Right. Right. But what we don't do, or what we, I, I think we fail to do, um, organizationally and individually, is we, we fail to learn how to how to lose, right? And then what ends up happening is because we don't really have uh, a constructive manner in which we reflect on losing, particularly when ho- human life um, was ultimately the, uh, the 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 consequence, Be- because we don't have a process psychologically that helps us to absorb that and helps us to, um, to, to reflect in a really productive way. 
we, we come back to what we know and what we can easily measure the, the tactics, the techniques, you know, the, uh, like you said earlier, shooting, shooting a range. We come back to what's familiar, what's easy to measure. Um, and what's easy to even talk about because we have a, we have a language that we're comfortable, you know, particularly in some of the more, um, a, a, aggressive sports or, or, uh, um, military uh, occupational specialties. Well, that, was, that was such an insightful answer. And uh, I think that was one thing, you know, having gone through like a special operations type selection and then training pipeline. I mean, that that's, seemed like the whole point in retrospect was just to teach candidates how to deal with failure, but not necessarily to be okay with it, but just to recognize that like, you're not, you're not always going to win. And then how do you conduct yourself? Like you said, when you do everything you were taught, and it still doesn't work, and there might not even be a perfect solution, but just, you know, even, even in some of the situations we encountered, they were meant for you deliberately to lose, and there, there, was, no, there was no way to win, but it's like, all right, well, when you encounter, you know, one obstacle, how do, you, how do you problem solve on the fly and try to find another solution? And then when that doesn't work, basically just how do you keep going until you run out of options, then you ultimately lose, but you're never, you're never really giving up, and it's not like, well, I'm, I'm mentally tough, I'm never going to quit, it's more... I, I'm never going to stop thinking. Um, and it, it sounds like that's kind of what you guys are, are trying to do. And it's, I mean, it's obviously, you know, an innate component of that, but it's also very trainable. And it's cool to see that you guys are making that distinction with how to prepare people psychologically for, for stress and recognizing that, you know, failure needs to be a part of that. I think a lot of times like in, in training, whether it's in any field, field of work, now we're kind of like so obsessed with success and, to a certain point, like not, not hurting people or making them feel vulnerable where, you know, we deliberately avoid failure. Um, and I think there, it's, it's gotta be a fine line, right? Cause if people fail too much, they, they learn to be helpless and to not problem solve and to give up. But if you never expose them to that, then inevitably when they do leave that incubator of your training environment, then they're, you know, like they're at some point they're going to fail and what you teach them, the textbook thing isn't always going to work. So, um, I hope people really like absorbed what you said because it's a lot different than what's traditionally associated with mental toughness and it's kind of like why I don't like using that phrase and why you, even how you suggested that you don't think it's the best phrase but Vicky did an amazing job of, uh, of defining it so uh, thank you for that and then I wanted to talk a little bit about because I know having seen you talk you, you speak a lot about why why leaders and organizations need to have some kind of an ethical framework and then we we're talking o- offline you even tie that into the idea of, you know, why you want to avoid hyper commitment to a mission. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, why, why having that ethical framework is so important and then, and then how that can tie into um, that hyper commitment to mission? Sure. I, I'd be uh, glad to do so. And if I, if I may just follow up the, um, the, the previous conversation as it relates to what is what is mental toughness? I, I can confidently say, having having played competitive sports and spent a number of years in the fire department and then a number of years in the Marine Corps, um, it's been it's been operating in, in some pretty uh, challenging environments. That look, anyone that's anyone that served in units like that in environments is uh, as complex as that knows, or or on high ultra competitive teams knows, kind of intuitively knows. What, what it feels like to be on a team that plays to win and what it feels like to, to be on a team that where the leadership or the, or the players or, or the operators become content with um, playing not to, not to lose. And, you know, sometimes that distinction is, is, is ever so subtle, but it's incredibly significant. And oftentimes the, the distinguishing factor there is, is, is a psychological one. It's not a practical one. It's it's not a technical one. It's psychologically there's there's something that's it's it's holding you back, and, and just being able to have a language and a conversation and a kind of a thought process that that goes goes with that um, is is critical, and that and that then ties into uh, the the ethical component. Um, you know, the the bottom line is whether you're in the military or whether you're a law enforcement officer, or whether you're a first responder or a, a a firefighter, there is a, a a public expectation that we will put ourselves, expose ourselves to, to risk 
to promote the safety of of uh, of the citizenry. Um, and within the American Fire Service, within the last few few decades, the fire the American Fire Service has has adopted this culture of of safety that I wouldn't even just say is focused is hyper focused on the safety and well being of of the firefighter like that you know most places you go in the united states and you ask the fight from the lieutenants to the captains to the fire chief what their primary mission is most of them will probably tell you um based on my own ex- experience having asked pose the questions to probably hundreds if not thousands of, of leaders is they're gonna say it's it's my primary mission is to ensure the safety of my of my firefighters those under my charge that that's certainly noble but that's not really consistent with your organization's strategic mission statement that says that the mission of this organization, this fire department, is to protect life, property, and the environment. Life being life of, of, of the citizenry, um, not just exclusively our, our, our own lives. And in order to, to honor that aspect of the mission, well, we, we have to expose ourselves to risk. The public certainly isn't expecting us to, to – to execute suicidal or kamikaze uh, missions where there's not a where there's not a a tangible uh, reward for for risk, but the expectation is is that we're going to put ourselves we're going to put ourselves out there and subject ourselves to, to risk to keep them uh, safe, not just not just physically but but psychologically, and, and and that's significant. And then the question is why why do we you know what? What was the impetus for us moving away f- away from that? You know, when did, when did the life safety of the of the American firefighter take precedence over the citizenry that we that we serve? And you know, I, I would make the case that there, there's a moral component to that, and that in many organizations, um, we we haven't uh, s- spoken at length or explicitly about the moral component of of uh, of what we do, um, which is absolutely, uh, absolutely critical. And, you know, all too often we, we, we tend to forget the why, right. And coming back to, I guess, Simon Sinek, you know, the, the, the why, um, it's, it's absolutely critical. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's very easy in the day to day grind to sometimes forget what it is that the public uh, it expects of us or, or probably even more accurately why they hold us in such high regard. Um, but the reason they hold it in high regard, such high regard is because their expectation is that we're going to honor our, our commitment to their life safety because that's what we've done uh, s- since the beginning of time. The, the challenge is that the desire for self-preservation is universal and, and um, it can really paralyze an, an organization when become leaders become focused on controlling outcomes and preventing loss rather than just trusting their troops in the process to achieve uh, achieve results. And the, the irony in all of this is that the military and first responders are paid to achieve results, but all too often when you look at our risk management models, they're rules-based and, and not, not results-based. Um, and, and as it relates to the ethical framework and, and, and more obligation, I think I touched on this earlier, but we we'll use the military as an example, a, a tactical leader, a, a platoon commander, a lieutenant or a captain. There's, there's so many different forces in, um, that he's obligated to morally, legally, administratively, procedurally, right? You're, you're a young captain in the Marine Corps. You're, you're an infantry company commander. You, you're obligated to the tactical mission, um, kind of the operational and strategic mission, the force protection element, taking care of your, your subordinates, the, the legal and administrative constraints and restraints, the institutional image of, of the service of which you, you represent, your own moral and, por- uh, moral and personal ethos, um, ranging from family values to, to, to spiritual to religious, and as well as your self-interest. So you find yourself in a complex situation, and, and it's uh, you know it happens pretty pretty frequently in environments as complex as Iraq or Afghanistan, where if you're going to take an action, 
sometimes you're going to find yourself in a situation where that that action or that decision it's it's not it's not possible for it to to honor your obligation to all of those forces that that are, that are at play, you know, by by honoring your your commitment to, to one, now you're potentially compromising your commitment to another, and from for my from my perspective, that in itself is a uh, is, is a you know presents poses a, mor- a moral challenge or a, a moral dilemma. Just just being aware of that. You know, back similar back to the the mental performance piece. Just even fostering a greater sense of uh, awareness at the individual level or the or the team level will certainly pay pay off. You know, if you've had conversations uh, about these these dynamics, you know, these these soft skills per se um, on the front end of an employment when you when you find yourself in a situation where uh, you know you've walked into it, you've inherited a moral a moral dilemma. Um, you're, you're much more likely to be able to uh, to, to, to navigate it. I'm, I'm certainly not going to say with ease, but but to navigate it in, in a productive uh, fashion, where where everyone is committed to fostering um, the, the greatest outcome possible. For sure. And then you talked obviously about the the commander's intent concept and commitment to the mission, knowing what that organizational vision is. You also, we, you know, we talked earlier um, before we started recording about, you know, the downside to to hyper commitment to the mission and how sometimes the the like the the need for the desire for individual self preservation um, can can lead to hyper commitment to the mission where you know like a leader can't walk away because effectively to walk away is admitting that something was strategically wrong. So can you talk a little about just you know that kind of um, that dilemma and w- what the downside is to taking any of these things to the extreme i'm sorry doug the, the dilemma regarding well the dilemma regarding so you know you, you might hyper commitment to the mission where you have a leader who's so interested in his or her own self-preservation that he, he or she holds steadfast to maybe a mission that's not likely to to have a good outcome uh, strictly because to 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 uh, cease adhering to that mission would be to admit a, a flawed strategy and and, and pr- reflect poorly, presumably, upon that leader. Yeah, I mean that that that's certainly an instance where I mean I've, I've certainly seen it play play out firsthand where, um, you, you're almost you're you're almost p- playing the win uh, t- too much to the to the extent that you're, you know, intuitively or instinctively people people know. That you're, you're you're kind of heading down the wrong the wrong path, but there's a sense of commitment and loyalty. Like we're we've already committed to this. Is it is it too late to say to say no? I mean, it, it's it's far outside the scope of a military or, or fire department um, metaphor analogy. Those of which I'm probably most comfortable in, with, but it, it's kind of reminiscent of the the, the challenger, <laughs> right? Where everyone was so far along in, in the process. Um, that, that to admit that hey maybe maybe the O rings weren't right right or maybe they were uh, they, they they put the mission at risk it would almost be like defeating it um, failure uh, that that's uh that's tough but I mean the the best thing you can do in in all of these cases to, to prevent to prevent this right to prevent the command element. To, redu- to reduce the likelihood that you have a command element who's who's too aggressive versus a command element that's not nearly aggressive en- en- enough is is to foster relationships and, and communication that is is candid yeah right where where somebody can be constructively critical or like everyone retains the right to to question to question the plan. This doesn't necessarily mean you're questioning somebody's integrity. It doesn't necessarily mean you're questioning somebody's commitment, right, or their competency. But, but to question the, um, and I, I do think back to your your your, your question earlier about the, the structure and the distinction between officer and enlisted. I I, I do think at times um, that rigidity is is problematic. I mean, in Outliers, Gladwell dedicated an entire chapter to. Exploring the Korean airline this, this, uh, catastrophe, you know, airline crash after airline crash after airline crash, 
And in many instances, the co-pilot, who was junior to the senior pilot, said, I knew we were on a collision course. And then the, the investigator said, why didn't you, why didn't you say anything? Just, yeah. well, because I'm culturally, I'm deferential to seniority. Sure. And um, once they started to change that dynamic and once they made challenging authority with respect, you know, once they made that just part of doing business, guess what? The airline crash is uh, it's a greatly subsided. Yeah, and you talk about that human factor. I mean, the same thing. I don't know if it was Outliers or, or a different book talking about how in medicine you, you had surgeons, you know, doing operating on the wrong leg, and same thing. You know, there's there's that hierarchy in medicine where the, you know everybody b- b- sort of beneath, so to speak, the the lead surgeon was afraid to say something. They're like, well, isn't it? You know, kind of thinking to themselves, is it, are you sure this is the right leg? But not saying it now to to take kind of the the uh, the ego out of it. Now it's just required. Like they have checklists in medicine and whoever's kind of leading the surgery reads through the checklists and before commencing the surgery, you know, you got to go around the, the table. Does anybody have anything to add? And, you know, like, do we have the right leg? And, and so again, it's, it's, it's not to be overly critical or, or to make, make the stuff um, personal, but it's like, you know, how, how do we get out of our own way? And by kind of depersonalizing some of these processes, like you said, that's kind of the, the way to do it. Um, you're really generous with your time. We're, we're coming up on, on over an hour here. So I wanted to give you a chance before we go to just to talk about um, how people can learn more about you. And I know that, you know, for Leadership Under Fire, you have some events coming up and you even consult with some different, uh, whether it's corporate organizations, uh, sports teams, or, you know, even paramilitary units or, or federal units about how to implement some of these practices into their organization. So uh, if you could just close by talking about, you know, what you have coming down the pipe. Yeah, sure. So for more information pertaining to Leadership Under Fire, um, the, the organization that I'm uh, so, so so proud, the team that I'm so proud to uh, to lead and run, just go to leadershipunderfire.com on the uh, World Wide Web. And we have a national conference coming up uh, April 13th and 14th in Evanston, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. It'll be a two-day conference. And uh, the primary objective of the conference is to prepare leaders and organizations for the moral, physical, and mental rigors critical to optimal performance and mission-oriented leadership. A really diverse group of speakers and, and thought leaders and, and panelists this year, um, naval aviators, uh, a psychologist who's, who's uh, be- become the subject matter expert on, on breath and the connection between breath and, and, and performance. Uh, a retired Air Force fighter pilot who uh, flew with flew with John Boyd, someone uh, you know, pretty prolific individual. I'm sure many of your listeners are, are familiar with the contributions of, of Boyd. Uh, Lawrence Gonzalez, the author of the best-selling book Deep, Deep Survival, which uh, I, I think does a tremendous job of exploring um, risk in, in endeavors in, in or human endeavors in, in risk, not just from a technical or tactical perspective. But from a psychological and emotional uh, perspective, we're able to mentor performance coach there from the Philadelphia uh, F- Phillies. And it's just going to be a great, a really great two days. But for uh, more information on Leadership Under Fire and uh, check out the, the, the caliber of folks that we have involved with the team, leadershipunderfire.com. All right, awesome. Well, uh, thanks again for your time. And if I'd known you were a fan of The Wire, I would have invited you over. I just binged on it. I watched like five <laughs> seasons in a couple of weeks. So, um, We'll have to That's talk awesome. about that. I don't, have a TV, yeah. I don't have a TV, but I have the I have the box set. So yeah, all right, cool. Set. Well, uh, yeah, thanks again. Um, we'll, uh, we'll catch up again soon. All right, Doug. Thank you.